start because yeah. it's uh, of the hour. And um, I would like to introduce to you our two presenters today. Uh, we have Nina Rocco and Carol Graham, who I think is in the back. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, Nina, I have to, because these are terms that I don't use in my everyday language. <laughs> She's a career exe uh, technology executive and worked at, um, at a UN uh, agency. But now, she's a volunteer for RAMP and IRC and JBWS and uh, other local organizations uh, because she wants to help find support for our most vulnerable uh, people in our community. And Carol Graham, who just entered, uh, is the president of RAMP. I think most of you here know RAMP is Refugee Assistance Morris Partners. And so it's been in existence since 2016. 2016. Okay, and um, we've been, several members of our church have been involved. Um, and so I thought this was a, this is a very timely subject, uh, that of immigration. And um, so if we could open with prayer and then I will have over to Nina and Carol. Gracious God, thank you for this opportunity to come together on the second Sunday of Advent and learn about one of our nation's looming issues. We ask that you help us to see with eyes of love, compassion, and justice all the peoples of your world. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Nina. Thank you very much, Marnie. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for having Carol and I here on your Sunday morning. There is a lot of content on the refugee topic that I will go, to, go through today, so please don't hesitate if during you'd like me to slow down or clarify a point. I welcome dialogue throughout, and we are certainly hoping to have some time for question and answer towards the end. Okay, so our agenda this morning is, Marnie uh, was very gracious in her introduction, um, so you've met Carol and I briefly. We'll look at a global view of the refugee crisis to date, and then we'll spend some time peeling back the onion, if you will, looking at it from a U.S. perspective historically, and then how it's impacted our local New York, New Jersey region, and what small organizations are doing to try to impact the issue within our, our area, organizations such as RIMP. And then we'll spend a little bit of time, as there's uh, an administration change coming up and some anticipated uh, changes going forward, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about what that outlook could be and what organizations are trying to do to address that. Again, thank you for the introduction. Uh, we'll be happy to share some of these slides later so you can learn more about us. So currently, there are over 120 million individuals that have been forcibly displaced worldwide as a result of persecution, conflict, violence, or human rights violations. That number is at an all-time high um, since it, it could be measured, um, and it continues to increase. So at the moment, there's no sense of abatement to those numbers. And 73% of those refugees and other people in need of international protection come from just five countries at the moment. Any, any ideas as to what those five could be? No, I'm just pushing. I'm sorry? That's a really good, good question. Yes, now. yes, yeah. I would like to know. Yeah, because that's a staggering number. So when you look at the five countries that are impacting that the most, 73%, yes. I'm going to guess Haiti might be one of them. Interesting. That's a very good guess, especially given the ongoing conflict in Haiti. That's, it just continues to escalate at certain points. It is Afghanistan, Syria, Venezuela, Ukraine, and Sudan. Mm. So some of these countries that we've heard of conflict, particularly at higher points historically, they continue to have displaced individuals. 
And so that, that to me, that just gives a different perspective of where folks are coming from. When we further look at the breakdown of the 120 million, there are other categories and um, labels that I'll, I'll define in a little while. 43.4 of those are refugees. 63 are what's considered internationally displaced people. And again, I'll describe it to each of these momentarily. 6.9 are what's called asylum seekers. And 5.8 million are in need of international protection, oftentimes from their own government, a majority from Venezuela. That number, 120 million, you can see is equivalent to Japan's population. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, when you look at that, the 12th largest country in the world, all of those individuals don't have a home mm -hmm. at the moment. <coughs> Let's look at the definitions. So, a refugee is someone who's been forcibly, you know, um, had to flee his or her own country because of persecution, war, or violence. They are a status, though, that has rights, and we'll spend a little bit of time on this shortly, has rights in the country to which they fled to. So we have refugees in the U.S., and those refugees now have more access to services within the U.S. That differs a little bit when we look at internationally displaced people. An internationally displaced person has been forced to flee, but they're still within their borders. They haven't crossed an international border as of yet. Um, they may be seeking safety anywhere they can find it, in nearby towns, schools, settlements, <coughs> internal camps, usually supported by international organizations like the United Nations, um, and even forests and fields. They're just truly seeking safety, but they're still within their own country. So unlike refugees, IDPs are not protected by anyone because oftentimes you expect your own government to protect you and provide you services. But they're, they're in a position that they're in their home country but don't have access to medical care, um, to hospitals potentially, to schools, education. Uh, during 2023, the most significant changes in IDP occurred in Sudan, the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, Myanmar, Somalia, Syria, and Ukraine. So let's look at asylum seekers. 3.6 million are asylum seekers, and that's, these numbers are roughly 2023, we're still sorting out 2024 numbers, and they're seeking the right to be recognized as a refugee. So oftentimes, an asylum seeker has already left and sought from another country the right to be a refugee. And so they're seeking access to services, legal protection, and material assistance. Can I just one question? Of course. What does it take to be a asylum seeker? That is an excellent question. If you give me one moment, we're going to go through the process because I think that's another learning and something that we should um, clarify because many people make assumptions about entering a country and you're immediately a refugee with access to rights. And oftentimes the process is quite a lengthy one. So I promise you we'll address that. And if we don't, you hold me accountable and then we'll come back to it. <laughs> okay? Um, so that's asylum seeker. So they're still seeking protection. They may not have access to it as of yet. And then stateless people are those that are not a citizen of any country. So this can occur due to factors like complex border changes. So when you do think about the conflict in Sudan from several years ago, Sudan had formerly been one, one nation and then had broken up. So when those borders are evolving or changing, you could have what's considered a stateless individual because they don't have a place as of yet. Um, other, and that's a difficult one to measure, right? Where do you get the numbers and statistics for stateless individuals? But other examples in addition to Sudan of stateless people might be in Myanmar, where the Rohingya, which is the Muslim mi minority, aren't really recognized as a group by their own government as well. And so, you know, there's an element of statelessness there also. Okay, so let's look into how this comes into the US. So that's at a global perspective. The numbers are staggering. You know, the, the conflicts are complicated. But how does it affect us here in the U.S.? 
historically, and this is since about 1975 or so when data and information start to really be gathered and organized, there have been about three million refugees that have been able to legally resettle in the US. The, all 50 states have welcomed refugees and there are about eight federal agencies that are involved in the process, and again, we'll spend some time, and 25,000 have resettled in 2022, which is double the previous year. And we'll look at how over, over history, US resettlement has ebbed and flowed both in terms of numbers, as well as the countries of origin that are arriving here. Uh, something to note is that refugees do not choose the country in which they would like to live. So if I'm fleeing from Ukraine, I do not get to choose and say I would like to go to the US or go to Greece or Italy. Um, usually it's an organization like UNHCR, which is the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, that will determine based on multiple factors where might you be most successful based on language, opportunity, even just space and availability of services. Mm -hmm. So that's an important note. Yes. And how does a potential refugee access UNHCR? Usually the um, UNHCR will often go to the first to areas of conflict where they know that there is displacement. Um, and UNHCR is the organization that helps set up these refugee camps and the infamous blue tents, which are the UN colors and such, to provide immediate services. And some of those services are exactly that, you know, work towards resettlement to get them out of safety. So they'll provide emergency services such as water, you know, medical care from, and obviously in partnership with other organizations like um, Doctors Without Borders is an example, International Red Cross. So bringing those services to those communities, including where's the next step. And when there are probably some places where it's comparatively easier for them to set up that presence mm -hmm. and some places where it's simply too dangerous? That's correct. It's very complicated because oftentimes you do need um, cooperation from the countries, which could be border countries, not necessarily you know the country of conflict, obviously but it could be border countries, you need cooperation. Um, there's hesitancy at a diplomatic level sometimes, right, because it's influenced politically. Um, so yes, it is, it is complicated for many reasons to try to come in, and, uh, and certainly for the health and safety of the UN peacekeeping uh, individuals that are participating. Yes. That's correct. So this, you know, these are what's recognized definitions that I had described for refugees, asylum seekers. There are many that are still seeking this status. Um, and so we'll talk about undocumented workers when we look at that outlook ahead because the deportation of illegal immigrants is a topic as of late. So we'll touch upon that as well. In a case where a camp like this is set up, not within the country itself, but in the border country, who is whose responsibility for feeding community as such? UNHCR, as an international, non-governmental organization, will take on that responsibility. Now, the UN as a whole is comprised of about 190 member states who contribute financially to what are agreed upon goals, sustainable development goals, the right to water, clean water, the right to education, etc. So under the funding that the UN as a whole and certain agencies like UNHCR receive, they are given a right to execute on their mission. In the case of UNHCR, their mission to help refugees are those that are displaced. And so they, the, the costs of that affect us in that way, you know, the contributions, the funding, um, but they take on the responsibility of the organization, um, collaboration and coordination of other local services, other organizations like International Red Cross, Doctors Without Borders, et cetera to try to do their best to provide the services that the communities need. It's not an easy problem to, <laughs> to solve. Um, in the US, we'll start to talk about the admissions process. There's three priorities in which the US starts to take in refugees or consider. Pr 
Priority one are those individuals that have been referred to by, to us, to the U.S., by UNHCR. Um, priority two are groups of special humanitarian concern, intentionally vague so that you can define it at the time. Mm -hmm. So the war with Ukraine, for example, got immediate attention in the U.S. because they're considered you know, a special humanitarian concern. Mm -hmm. And the third is for family reunification purposes. So if we know that there's a large group of uh, family members from a particular country and you're looking to reunify them, especially the children, that will take a priority. So let's talk about the process because that's an excellent question. If you look at this, the U.S. Re refugee resettlement process is not an easy one. There's a lot of check boxes to check. Screening by eight federal agencies, that includes the Department of Homeland Security, FBI, <coughs> excuse me, the State Department. Six security database checks, including biometric security checks, um, uh, screened against all U.S. federal databases, medical screening, the in-person interviews, cultural orientation, sponsorship assurances, and then finally a referral to the IOM, um, which is a different organization, uh, International Organization for Migration, um, and they help with the transportation. But in of itself, that's a referral. You still have to go through the IOM process. So how long do you, do you guys think this process takes? Oh, as gosh. an average. <laughs> <laughs> it's at minimum two years, 18 to 24 months, and that time period can be affected depending on the political climate, the economic climate, of any given country, especially ours. And so it's a minimum two year process and it's a pretty extensive one. So I think one of the first things to debug amongst folks is that it's easy to come in and become a refugee. And in the meanwhile, um, these individuals, these families might be living in a camp or just a state of uncertainty without access to, you know, to particular things. So, so this is the happy path to resettlement, right? There can be a lot of things that affect this. If you don't have your paper, going to DMV <laughs> is a no, process, I, right? And if yeah. you don't have exactly the right form <laughs> for a transfer of title or whatever it may be, and folks that have left their homes in an emergency, in a crisis, um, have to prove themselves constantly. So this is truly the happy path to resettlement. I think I saw it. Yes. Question: The in-person interviews uh, is it significant whether or not they speak English? Usually, translators can be provided. But, I mean, uh, are they more likely to be accepted if they speak English? I personally don't know. I don't know that information. I mean, usually, translators for most of the organizations, human organizations, and I suspect the U.S. Um, are provided to help. I. I would like to think and hope that that doesn't lend a bias to admissions. I will say that I remember I was at a, a summer institute on immigration into America and saw some very interesting video in which some of these interviews were taped and released at there in Washington. And I am pretty sure that we don't talk about um, shortly what our local region is looking like in terms of refugee admittance and the backlog um, among some of the legal aids in New York, New Jersey is close to 200,000 cases. So you're absolutely right. There's a backlog of legal aid and advocates, um, officers, um, and those that can provide the necessary support to these individuals. And yes. I recall it's a pretty extensive interview Yes. You know, it's not five minutes. Oftentimes these international organizations, they're still potentially living in a camp or a resettlement area um, and while they're waiting for these. Mm -hmm. So, 
Let's look at refugee admissions. So now you've learned a little bit about the process and some of our numbers over um, time. So this graph shows you by color their source of the region of origin. So you know whether it's Asia or Europe or former um, USSR, etc. And then it shows you over the time period the ebbs and flows. And I think you know it might be pretty apparent that there's a lot of changes to the volume of refugees we receive depending on what might be happening in the world. So a dip right after 9/11 in the U.S. makes sense to me um, because we stopped a lot of those processes as we were looking and reevaluating threats to, to the U.S. and to the area. Um, in early 2017, you'll see that the first Trump administration suspended the resettlement of Syrian refugees um, as well as non-citizens from several nations, uh, Iran, Iraq, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen. So you'll see that after that came in, there was a dip that impacted post-2016, 2017. Um, and that's that sharp decline there from those that, that administration's policies. Uh, and then 2021 saw a historical low um, because the administration decreased the ceiling from 15,000 to, to 15,000. And it had never been that low. So these are the numbers coming in but there's presidential ceilings that are imposed on how many refugees we as a country will take. So at that time, it was 15,000, and that ceiling hadn't been that low since 1975. Um, after that, <coughs> the ceiling has increased, and you'll see the sharp rise. Um, I didn't have the color, so I added these numbers after the fact. So you'll see the sharp rise after 2021's dip of 11,000 coming in. Um, in 2022, 2023, the ceiling went up significantly. I think um, that administration put it at about 150,000. And so, oh, I'm sorry, 50,000. And then so you'll see it start to rise as the process caught up a little bit. I think an interesting thing is where are the refugees coming from? And again, you can see that in the colors. But just as an example, because it changes depending on what's going on in the environment. In 2012, the majority of our refugees came from Bhutan, Myanmar, Iraq, and Somalia. In 2022, again, it might be a surprise to most, the majority came actually from Democratic Republic of Congo, Syria, Myanmar, Sudan, and then very closely Sudan was followed by Afghanistan and Ukraine. Those numbers of Sudan, Afghanistan, and Ukraine were pretty close um, in 2022. So you know our, our demographics change as the times as the times change as well. So can anyone? So this is refugee admissions and their source of origin over the years. And like I said, they're increasing. It's been increasing in 23 and 2022. Um, can anyone guess? And I said 50 states accept refugees. Which state? takes the most refugees. Give me a couple of states, which are our top two, three, four states that take refugees in, because that's also managed at a state level, once they come in. New York. New York. New York, that's a good guess. California. California, another good one. You're right, Texas. So, Texas actually joins California and New York Michigan and Ohio in taking the most number of refugees in. But Texas is historically taking the most refugees in when you compare it to the other states, which I think is an interesting fact. Um, but those five states alone received one third of our total refugees that have come into this country over the past 12, 12 years or so. Um, now, how refugees come in, <coughs> States differ significantly by the refugees' countries of origin. So for example, refugees from Afghanistan made up the largest groups in California and Virginia. Again, that's not to say that they're not in other states. Ukrainians were the top group in Washington state, and Venezuelans were top in Florida, and Somalians were the largest in Michigan. So arriving refugees are placed in communities based on the factors like their needs, family ties, the receiving community's language and ability to support, you know, the cultural elements of that community, educational and job opportunities, and cost of living. 
And so there's a lot of different factors, but I think it's uh, just interesting to know where people land and how they get there. So let's take a look at where New York and New Jersey fits in. I'm sorry, please keep me on track because I know you have something, <laughs> another <laughs> service. I don't want to take too much time. So I'll, I'll start to move a little quickly. In our area, Venezuela, Ecuador, and Colombia are the top countries of origin for New York-based asylum seekers. Um, New Jersey populations do include uh, folks from Afghanistan, um, especially via some of the initiatives that our state has supported. Um, the Middle East, Central America, Caribbean, South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Ukraine, Cuba, and Haiti, <coughs> as was pointed out earlier. All right? And people from Venezuela make up the largest portion right now of asylum seekers, so 41% um, are from Venezuela, so I don't know if I saw that. Many get initial resettlement services from organizations like CWS, Church World Service, and IRC, International Rescue Committee, both huge organizations that Carol and Lamp work with to help receive families to help resettle in our Morris County area. So, RAMP since 2016 has helped to bring refugees to bridge to what we call a new life here in the Morris County area of New Jersey. Um, I love hearing the story of RAMP and that's how I got involved with it. If you look, if you recall that other graph since 1975 of the, the numbers of families and sources of origin, when you look at who RAMP has been able to support, um, we have families first from Syria, then Afghanistan, and now El Salvador, and we're expecting another family, I'm sure Carol will address this um, later. Uh, we're expecting yet another family coming in shortly. And we've been able to support these families with teenagers, with their parents, we've supported individuals as well, and help them resettle and acclimate here. Because as I mentioned, um, CWS and IRC will host families and help with the initial resettlement, oftentimes for about 12 months or so. And then after that, it's often local organizations and nonprofits like RAMP that assist. I think just for perspective, it takes about $40,000 um, a year for RAMP to help support. And the average amount of time is a little bit over a year, 12 to 15 months, with about 20 volunteers helping them with medical services. They don't have driver's licenses transportation, driving them back and forth to medical appointments, to various, you know, interviews or, you know, administrative tasks, um, helping support getting children into the school system. There is a significant amount of effort and work that I think we take for granted when we do some of these activities, getting groceries, right? So, you know, all of those items, these RAMP volunteers uh, really help do, and it's something that even though my time with RAMP is relatively short-lived, I'm very, very proud to know that organizations like this exist in the area to actually make impactful change. And again, um, I don't want to take away because I'm sure Carol will talk about, but many of the refugee families that have come in are now citizens. Um, you know, one of the oldest children that came in is now applying to college next year, um, and some work, uh, some are serving in the military. It's something that um, is a big achievement. So RAMP's work and work of CWS and IRC is not done though. If we look forward, knowing that um, we have a new administration coming in, I want to spend a little bit of time looking at the outlook. For me, to understand what's happening going forward, I would like to look at the past and I like to look at history. So there were some indications in the first term of you know, how refugees were treated. And so again, for sake of time, I won't necessarily read through all of these, but within 2017 and 21, and we saw some of this reflected in the graphs, there was a significant reduction in refugee admissions. There was increased security screening. So we walked through that very extensive process that I shared with you, that was the, the typical. Um, that was exacerbated to extreme vetting procedures during this time period. So that further impacted the duration and the timeline it took to even achieve refugee status. There were restrictions on certain countries of origin and as I've touched upon, the majority of them were Muslim um, countries. There were cuts to resettlement programs and funding and I'll tell you, um, I do volunteer with IRC as well. There was concern 
about cuts of some of that funding to organizations that need that funding to provide the services that they do to families seeking resettlement. And there was a focus on nearshore refugees. So those that are close, um, you know, support for refugees closer to their countries of origin instead of the U.S. So for example, you know, can the Venezuelan asylum, asylum seekers seek refuge in Mexico versus the U.S.? And I think that becomes a, a difficult argument when you know that there's a lot of fleeing from war, conflict, and violence um, from many of the similar countries that, are, that share borders. So that was the first term. In the second term, what are people um, anticipating? So there's anticipation that we'll, there will be further reduction or phasing of refugee admissions, and that there will be um, expansion of travel bans and country restrictions, and that these asylum cooperation, cooperation agreements with other nations will allow us to, let's say, redirect refugees to different countries other than the US. Um, there is a focus on domestic capacity and local self-reliance. So I think the suggestion there is, well, we don't need the U.S. to help support. You know, there's a lot of nonprofits or you know international global organizations that will be able to provide their support. I think there's an assumption about how overstretched you know these organizations already are, and to place additional burden on that local self-reliance, I think you know is a, a true solution, and a potential moratorium entirely on new refugee admission. So these are things that the refugee resettlement organizations are gearing up for um, and trying to anticipate in terms of, okay, if this were to happen, how do we address that? And I think it's clear the impact um, to refugee policy. There are likely be fewer opportunities for resettlement, greater isolation of those communities, heightened security for certain nations, and a long-term impact on the U.S. humanitarian policy. So, Again, you know, these are impacts that we're anticipating. Something I did want to touch upon, you know, which is not directly related to refugees and asylum seekers and the displaced individuals, um, is the deportation threat. So there are estimated 11.3 million unauthorized immigrants in the U.S. as of mid-2022, and that number has been growing. I think the interesting thing I'd like to point out about that number is that the number of illegal immigrants from Mexico has actually decreased by more than half in the past two years. So I think there's certain assumptions on the source of origin of these illegal immigrants. The illegal immigrants from Mexico has decreased. The reason that is significant to me is that, as I mentioned, deportations require cooperation with origin countries. So if the suggestion in terms of policy is we don't need to take them, you know, maybe Mexico can hold on to them for a little while. It requires cooperation from Mexico to agree to that. Mm -hmm. And I think if you've heard the news recently, um, she's pretty much stated, the president has pretty much stated that they do not agree <laughs> to that, um, particularly when they know that it's not their citizens who are illegally migrating mm -hmm. here. Yes. How big of an effect, a negative effect, do you think the illegal immigration, <clears throat> for instance, at the southern border, has impacted the ability of these refugee organizations to, uh, has it had a big effect, a big negative effect? I think from, <clears throat> from a perception perspective, mm -hmm. which is oftentimes a, a big effect because it influences your local legislators and what you push for and what you strive for, I think from a perception perspective, unfortunately, it's had a big negative effect. I think there's a misconception. Um, refugees and illegal immigrants are often bucketed together, which is why I did want to touch upon this. Um, because there is that perception as to what services are being provided for free to, to folks, and the lack of understanding of the process, as we, we've seen now, to achieve refugee status here. Yes. So. Um, I cannot quantify it. I'm sure that there's much of our data that I, I'm sharing here is from organizations like Migration Policy Institute, UNHCR. Um, I'm sure that there's some element of numbers that can talk about the impact, but uh, unfortunately, I think there is one. Yes? I would like to ask you a personal question, if it's okay. Can I? 
you've been asked. <laughs> you are welcome to ask. <laughs> Um, I would like to answer that, and then I would like Carol to help me answer yeah, that too. Yes. Yeah. 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 So you mm -hmm. know, um, but if you, because I am conscious of your time, and I recognize you all have a service after. I just have like one or two more, and it might actually touch upon a little bit. And I will, I will answer your question, and I'll ask Carol to join me on that. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. <laughs> so give me. So in talking about deportation. I think something I do want to share is that from a data perspective, in 2017 to 20, or 16 to 20, there were fewer deportations actually than the administrations before and after. Now, that's not to say that going forward that might not change because there's been an acceleration of a lot of policies and, you know, et cetera, um, and planning. But I do want to not neglect that from a data perspective, the deportation plans that were even spoken about before didn't actually come to fruition because it's a difficult problem to execute on. So, so like the highest one during the Clinton administration. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. And I think that's, you know, again, uh, important to be objective and then to understand what can make this happen and, and also, you know, what impacts it. Um, a little bit to the question about what keeps me uh, uh, grounded <laughs> or optimistic is there are a lot of innovative solutions that a lot of organizations around the world are doing because they recognize that the process is painful, it's lengthy, and it's difficult. And so I, I will not get into these, um, and I, I welcome folks to learn more about them. I'm still learning more about them. There's something called Complementary Pathways, for which there was a webinar on last week. But there are a lot of innovation, innovative solutions that are being tested and tried um, globally across Europe, et cetera, where they're trying to expedite and get local organizations, once again, like IRC, like RAMP, local community groups, to help alleviate the burden a little bit more in a faster way than they see that the process is happening. So there are folks that are out there that are trying different things. And this is something that helps me keep hope um, that there's recognition of need, there's a recognition to scale solutions, and there's a recognition to do it faster. And one of the things that helps me is that I meet people that care to learn about it to listen, to ask questions, organizations and people like Carol and Ramp that are doing something about it. Um, and I know that that interest, that optimism, that desire to help, that desire to build relationships, understand and clarify when you're talking to others um, and share some of the learnings is what keeps me optimistic that there's large communities that care very much and that are here to support and individuals that will that will certainly make a difference in the lives of these families and these communities. So, um, and this is Luna, who's the teenager, one of the first families that Ramp took on in 2016, who is applying for college next year, um, and such an active individual. And she's another reason why so many people do the work that they do. But. I'd like to ask Carol to also answer that question about optimism and then maybe spend some time talking about RAMP and then Carol and I are here to talk about RAMP and the refugee uh, crisis. I've always found that when I get upset or worried or uh, start feeling a little hopeless, that what works for me is to look outside of myself and do something for somebody else. 
Um, and it doesn't necessarily matter what that is, but if I can do something to help someone, I feel as if, I sometimes think about life as the experience of tossing a pebble into a pond. I'm sure that has been, that metaphor has been done before, but you know, if you toss a pebble in that's negative energy, that's what spreads. If you toss something in that's positive energy, that's what spreads. So that if I do something that helps someone else, then that energy is out there and it's a balance to the negative energy in the world. Okay, so that's kind of how I got involved with RAMP. I started in 2017. Uh, with the second family, I, I just, I was so distressed about the way um, people were talking about immig immigrants and immigration. Um, and I just felt that I needed to do something to counterbalance that. I think about my own family. Um, all four of my grandparents came here in the early part of the 20th century uh, from southern Italy. They were peasants, farm workers, they were illiterate. They were the ones nobody wanted. And all they brought was themselves. They, um, my grandfathers were laborers. My grandmothers worked in the home. They took in sewing in the winter. They did farm work in the summer. The kids went to the farms and took, picked vegetables. My mother and father did that. Um, my mother told the story of when they picked green beans, and this was, this was farms in Essex County. <laughs> <laughs> they picked green beans and they got paid 10 cents a bushel. And my mother said when the bushel was almost full, they fluff it up. <laughs> <laughs> so they could go and get their 10 cents. Um, and my, in my parents' generation, they were factory workers, retail workers, uh, homemakers. And uh, then in later generations, there are doctors, lawyers, accountants, scientists, professors, teachers, business owners. You know, it, immigration is so much more than the people who cross the border. And you know, I'm sure your families have, a lot of your families have stories like that as well. So remembering that and finding a way to toss a little positive energy into the pond is, uh, is the way to go. And when I when I speak for RAMP, I never ask for money because money seems to be the easiest thing. We do have people who donate. Churches like yours, Anya, and and individuals who donate pretty regularly. And that's a blessing to us because it does take about forty thousand dollars each time we take a family. And so we do need the money. That's important. But what's harder for us is getting enough people to do the work. Uh, we need people to be on family teams, to work directly with the family. And a lot of the jobs are fairly simple. I mean, some of them are uh, complex and time consuming, but some of them are fairly small. Are you bringing someone to buy groceries every week? Or, um, Supplying the family with uh, clothing when they need, when the season changes or the kids grow and they need new clothing. Um, and there are a lot of, and then we also, uh, part of my uh, responsibility in my presidency, one thing I wanted to do was to establish a series of committees that would support the family team. It would take some of the pressure off the family team. So we now have a committee for housing. So the family team doesn't have to find housing. We have a committee for employment. So we have people help to find jobs. We have a committee for education to supply tutors. Um, we just started a social services committee to help with getting the, the part of the, of the work. So uh, all of that is working together because it takes a lot of people. The committees need more people. The teams need people. We uh, just brought a family in from El Salvador and we are hoping, because of the changes that we're expecting, we're hoping to bring an, another family in in January. That's, that's kind of a quick turnaround for us. Uh, and, and I'm hoping, although 
I'm not sure um, my uh, team development committee shared that I'm hoping they can put another team <coughs> together um, by March or so uh, before the close to the event, at least. Um, and so ways of uh, there's lots of ways of getting involved on committee or family team. And I ask for people. The other thing that is really a challenge for us is finding housing. Finding apartments, uh, not only that we can afford, but that we can turn over to a family in 12 to 15 months. Mm -hmm. It helps if we have landlords who will work with us and work with the family. Uh, that's hard to find, though. So my other request is, if you know anybody who owns property, uh, or uh, have any connections to uh, anyone who has apartments, that, uh, that could be helpful. Or if you'd like to be on the housing committee, they could use help. So that's, uh, I'll let you finish. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, go ahead. Do you want to mention the things that you yes, brought? Yes, I can. We're here to take any more questions. I mean, it's a it's a big problem, um, obviously, and it is very complicated, um, affected by so many different factors, and so it relies on the interests of individuals and organizations like RAMP and its volunteers to help. But if you have any more questions, we're here to answer any. Luna uh, was part of our first family. She was eight years old when she came. She spoke no English. Uh, she now does art works and writes poetry and she started a business for herself uh, for college fund. She makes bookmarks and uh, she has a website so, <laughs> <laughs> so I buy a bookmark. Um, and she, she is a sophomore in college in high school this year so she won't be going to college for two years but um, where, where did she go I can't give any personal oh, information okay, about anybody. Yeah. Uh, we Somebody don't need more than the But uh, last, uh, when was it? In the spring, I think, we asked her to make a bookmark for RAMP that we could uh, give out. So you may have a bookmark as well. Just pass some of them around and uh, yeah, share some. Yes. We have friends. personal situation in that way. Um, uh, to be honest, I don't know. I think it's so individualized. Did he have to leave and stay elsewhere for a significant amount of time? Six months or so? Do you, do you know? It, to be honest, I'm not sure. And everyone's situation is, is so different. Um, I don't know what would have caused that to happen. Um, I got naturalized when I was in college. And so, um, again, even that, so the process that we went through was to receive refugee status. Those refugees, in, including ramps and people like Luna, also went through a process to get naturalized and to get citizenship, which is also not an easy one. So, you know, you think of all of these various steps to be recognized and accepted by American society as an American, um, and that's by, by paper only. If people come as refugees, they have to wait a year to get a green card. And that's an expensive process. There are, uh, it, costs, it can cost a couple thousand dollars to get a green card. And we, we pay for that. Lab will pay for that process for, for people. For our people. Oh, um, hopefully, all these refugees that come in through the programs of what you guys described, they all become citizens. That's up to them. Um, oh, okay. All of our people who are eligible have become citizens. Yeah, it takes five years. You have to wait five years to apply for citizenship. So, 
all of our people who are 15 or long enough have applied. Uh, Luna's whole family now, uh, they're all citizens. The, the parents became citizens and then the, the uh, young people were naturalized uh, through the parents. Uh, if, here, if they don't seek citizenship, can they just stay here forever? You, can, can, you can continue to renew the green card and stay here as a permanent resident. I think one of the laws, I mean, there's just so many rules and laws that seem a little strange. Our daughter was five months old when we adopted her, but she still had to become a citizen. You would think, you know, we adopted her legally, and you would think she would automatically be a citizen, but she wasn't. And I thought that was very, very strange, you know. But it didn't take five years. No, it was a year. One more sheet that is a history, brief history of Lamp and an explanation of what our uh, needs are for volunteers. So I will pass that later as well. Yeah, unfortunately, I can't speak to that. You know, when you find an individual because it does differ, uh, and it's complicated because of that. I was just going to say on a personal level because I have, um, I was doing tutoring in ESL, which I'm not at all trained to do. And every time I went, I thought, I, I did work on the, the manuals and the information that we had to work with, but I kept thinking every time I was there, the most important thing is that she knows that I care enough to come. Yeah. And I am, I'm done with that official job, but she and her daughter are going to come for tea. And, uh, you know, and I just feel like if I were moved to another totally foreign place, I would just need to know that someone cared, even if they didn't teach me very good English. <laughs> we, have, we have an education committee now. The uh, board member who is, who is overseeing that is a, a trained teacher. She's putting together um, curriculum for people. Uh, we're working on putting together an ESL library. Uh, so the materials will be available. So if any of you are interested in doing that, um, you can contact, uh, go to our volunteer project, and uh, become a tutor. There will be support to do that. Um, and I, I know you Oh, and I, I'm sorry that we do have to look at, at our watches and, and be concerned about the worship service, but I just want to thank both of you for your work, for your interest, and all that you have presented us with, because you hear so much, and <clears throat> I feel like this is more truthful than some of what we hear. So thank you very much.